I built a big clock. Let me show you how. So I wanted to make a giant clock. I wanted to make this look like King Kong had come and ripped the face of this off a big bin and hung it on our wall. So I pitched the idea to the wood staff at Issue Planning and they rejected it. So this is going to be the first in a series of videos I'm calling Rejected by Wood Magazine. And it's also the last in the series once our editor-in-chief Dave hears about it. So let's make this fast. I've got a five foot by five foot sheet of Baltic birch quarter inch thick. That gives me the largest clock face that I could cut out of uh, sheet goods that were readily available in my area. And then I have double face taped that to pink foam insulation uh, to use as a spoiler board. That in turn is attached to this uh, framework that is screwed to my sawhorses. I've got my Mini-Me Parker behind the camera. I've obviously got uh, quarantine-induced cabin fever and I've got a healthy dose of masochism. So let's get started. To cut the clock face, I'm going to mix some old school and new school power tool woodworking. This is the Shaper Origin. It is a CNC router built into a plunge router form factor. But first I'm going to cut out the waste on the outside of the clock face using my plunge router and this crude trammel that I've slapped together. Then I'm going to go back and cut the clock details using the Origin. So my router base plate has these handy little sockets that are used to attach an edge guide. And so I just made a trammel to fit in those out of some round bar stock, scrap wood, epoxy, and a screw. Uh, this was just a temporary jig uh, that I slapped together and now I've used it for over a decade. Uh, there, if you want something a little prettier, they make a lot of them that you can go out and buy. So I connected the corners of the sheet with a straight edge to find the center of the sheet where I drilled a pilot hole and screwed the trammel in place. And I just slide the router onto the trammel until the bit just touches the edge of the plywood. And then I just plunge and route around the circle. So using the origin starts with covering the workpiece in this special tape. And the tape is made up of patterns that look kind of like a cross between QR codes and dominoes. And the router uses that to orient itself in 3D space. And so once I have the tape in place, uh, I can use the camera built into the origin to scan the tape covered workpiece. And it will stitch together kind of a digital panorama of the workpiece and the tape. And then once you have that mapped out, you can optionally overlay a virtual grid onto the virtual workpiece. And so I'm centering the grid on the pilot hole that I drilled earlier. Then I just load my clock design from the USB drive, lock that design on the grid sitter point, and then that design gets projected onto the scan of the work piece from earlier. I target one of the design's paths with the crosshairs, enter some information about the cut depth, cut line placement, and bit size. And I just push the button to plunge the bit and start following the outline projected onto the image of the workpiece. It's a little like coloring in a coloring book, but you don't have to know how to color very well. 
because as you cut, an offset cam rotates the spindle to compensate for any of your caffeine shakes. Okay, there we have it. Easy peasy giant clock face. Hey, Parker. Uh, Roman walks into a bar, holds up two fingers and says, Hey, bartender, give me five beers, please. Get it? <laughs> this one? <laughs> Dad joke. Dad joke, six shooters. I can't do that. Dad joke six shooters. So you guys are all okay, but this is the point in the video where all the trolls ran off to the comments to gripe about how if they had a shop full of specialized tools, they could do all of this just as easy as I could. And so to put that argument to bed, I'm gonna to try to do the same thing with a template. And so first I'm gonna show you how I made this template and then we'll see if we can use it to do the same thing we just did with the shaper. First, I'm going to use spray adhesive to adhere the pattern to a piece of hardboard. Then I will drill starter holes for my jigsaw and then jigsaw close to the line so we'll get a little rough cut here. Then I'm gonna take that jig and just use whatever tools I have to sand and file up to the line and clean this up. And so I'm starting with an oscillating spindle sander, but if you don't have that, just any files or chisels or sanding blocks uh, will work. Now I've found on these corners that it's easier to just kind of uh, pair away, kind of nibble away with a sharp chisel into these corners. It's not really necessary to get all the way up into these pointy corners like I'm doing here. We'll be using a, uh, a template guide bushing on the router uh, to follow these lines and that bushing really can't get up into these corners like I'm doing here. So um, only if you're kind of particular I do not have fancy wood rasps. I just have this kind of old set of uh, metal files. And so I found this a triangular one works well to kind of finish off the getting into the corners here. Um, and then just uh, file almost all the way up to the line and then just sand it smooth. It's probably gonna be more important that, that you have kind of smooth lines rather than just accurately following the pattern. Your, your pattern is just gonna be kind of your starting point and then whatever you end up with, that's what you meant to do. What will end up happening, this is a step and repeat jig, so we will be routing out an area, rotating it around and lining it up and routing out more areas. So if there's little variations in your where you, you didn't quite do the line right, nobody's gonna notice it because it'll look like you meant to do that. And just like some of the 
special people in our lives. Sometimes when you repeat mistakes over and over, it begins to look normal. And then this is just elbow grease until you're done. This is also a good time to uh, listen to music or podcasts or contemplate the mistakes you've made in your life that brought you here. Um, and so uh, I've been testing out these uh, Isotune links. This is their uh, newest uh, ear protection. And I'm kind of a fan of these uh, over, over the ear muff style protection because it seems to uh, drown out the power tool noise. Not that you need that here, but, um, uh, and then it also has Bluetooth connection to your music. Um, and so then the important thing about that is that, uh, I can listen to, uh, my music and then, uh, sing it really loud to embarrass Parker. Your love set my soul on fire. Set my soul on fire. Make eye contact. Don't look away. Your love set my soul on fire. I'm going to show this to all your friends. Love came from the east. Love came from the west. Love came from the one that loved me the best. Uh... <laughs> I got it. I got a teenager sigh. That may not make it into the final cut. I don't know. I mean, my singing's good enough. So I've already marked the center of my workpiece, and I'm going to cut the outside of this clock face the same way I did when I did the shaper. I'm going to use my plunge router on my trammel, and I am just going to work on this corner. I'm not going to do this whole uh, clock face for this demo. Uh, because I don't want to waste a full sheet of plywood on trolls. Now let's look at my plunge router setup for cutting with this template. I've got a, I'm starting with a quarter inch bit like I did with the Shaper Origin, and I've got a uh, guide bushing mounted in my router base plate. And so that guide bushing lets me run, run that bushing along the template while the bit cuts through the workpiece. You could also do something similar with a bearing guided bit, but for my setup that would mean I have all of this bit um, cutting below the template and that would go pretty deep into my uh, spoil board. So uh, I'm going to um, use the guide bushing where I can control the cut depth. Okay, there are a couple things to keep in mind about guide bushings. One, uh, your cut line will be offset half the difference between the diameters of the bushing and the bit. So for example, my bushing is uh, 7 sixteenths outer diameter and my bit is a quarter inch outer diameter and the difference is 3 sixteenths of an inch and so half of that difference is 3 30 seconds. So my cut line will be offset 3 32nd from my template line. So my template then has to be offset 3 32nd into the keep side or away from the uh, cut side. So if you're using a vector graphics uh, software like Illustrator like I was, um, that's going to be 6.75 points. I don't know what that is in Roman numerals. Parker, do you know what that is in Roman numerals? I don't know how you do decimals in Roman numerals. The other thing you need to keep in mind about guide bushings is your uh, base plate needs to be centered fairly precisely on your bit. And to do that, you'll use a centering cone. Um, I mounted that in the chuck through the base plate, loosened the screws on the base plate, and let the plunge kind of pop that up against that. And that just centers that uh, base plate on that cone. And then you tighten these back up and you've got it fairly well centered on the, on the chuck there. For the template, I've uh, screwed this in place in my in the center hole. Um, I have have three registration marks on the pattern on the other side, and so I transferred those um, across to this side, and so those just let me uh, line this up as I move the template around and um, continue my cuts. And so the template is made in one sixth, and so it'll take me six 
it would take me six times around. I'm only going to do the one for demonstration purposes, but you want to mark these registration mark registration lines on your uh, workpiece so that as you move around, you can continue to line that up. Okay. Next, I'm going to cut this scroll work part and I'm going to work my way from the center outwards. So I'm going to do the small ones first and work my way outwards. Now, as I get out to these larger pieces, you can see this um, is pretty thin. And so my router is going to have trouble riding on that uh, flat. So I've just cut some scraps of, of this uh, hardboard and I'll be just kind of taping them in as needed to have a, a little more bearing surface for my base plate there. Um, so let's see how that part goes. So I've switched over to an eighth inch bit so that I can get down a little farther into the corners on this pattern and clean that out. And that'll just give me a little crisper detail on the patterns. Um, the nice thing is that the math for the uh, eighth, inch, eighth inch bit, when I've paired this with a 5 16th inch uh, guide bushing, works out to the same as the quarter inch with the uh, 7 16th. So 5 16th minus 1 8 is 3 16th divided by two is 332nd. So I can use this same pattern and it's and that bit's gonna just follow those same lines until it gets to the corners and then it's gonna go a little deeper than the radius of that uh, quarter inch bit could. So I saved this part for last because you've got some choices you need to make about what you're gonna do for this number section. Um, when I was using the shaper, it was easy to just program in uh, 12 unique numbers, but now as we're going around, you can't just step and repeat uh, with this jig uh, for those numbers. Uh, so a few things you could do to make this easier uh, than cutting out individual numbers like we did on the shaper. Uh, you could, after you move this jig around and cut out all your shapes, you could use your trammel and cut around in this area and make this a separate ring and this part, this center section a disc you could hang those up separately. You could uh, cut another uh, piece of plywood uh, or acrylic in a circle and fix those to it if you want. Uh, paint numbers on with stencils. Um, use uh, Go buy house numbers and, and affix those to, to this section. Uh, if you just use the two separate shapes, you could hang those up separately on your wall and hang the uh, house numbers separately on your wall. Uh, so you got a lot of things, a lot of choices at this point. Um, if you want to do it like I did on the shaper and cut this out of this solid piece, a single solid piece, uh, it gets a little more complicated. And I'll show you what I came up with, um, and that is uh, individual templates for uh, the numbers. And so as you move around, you would need to place another, a, a different number in these little slots here, route each piece just like we did uh, this. What I'm going to do is just cut out this number um, and I'm not going to cut too far beyond uh, where this number goes because uh, the next number starts somewhere in here and I don't want to infringe on its space. So after I had all my numbers, I would take my trammel and then just use that to connect the dots between them. I don't want to go too crazy on the tape. And what you would do next is unclamp that 
and just slide this around and find your alignment mark right there. And then you're gonna clamp that down, um, make your next alignment marks here and over there. This would normally be a circle. Um, and then start routing again. So again, I would do the outside ring first and then the inside uh, scroll work. Um, I left in my pattern, I left a little uh, overlap here so that you're just kind of continuing those cuts all the way through and there's not anything to really clean up that much. Um, now then this is a one sixth. So for my pattern, I would, I've got line alignment marks also on the twelfths. And so I would just need to come back to this alignment mark here, put in the next number if you d decided to go that route and then, uh, route the number. And then later you can see here where I would need to connect the dots with the trammel. So then it's just a matter of going all the way around to complete the clock face. And that's how you do that with a template. Now, if you were smart, you already cut out the backdrop of your clock face from a five by five sheet of Baltic birch using a trammel. Um, but if you're me, uh, you have my sympathy because you're gonna try this out of frosted acrylic. Uh, now, I couldn't get a piece of 5x5 five five frosted acrylic for less than a fortune, so I found a 4x8 sheet. Um, check your nearest metro area for a plastic supplier. You probably can come by this yourself. Um, I'm going to have to then cut out pieces of this and, and fit it together like a puzzle and try to hide the seams behind some of the elements of the clock face. And so to do that, I am starting with a trammel to cut out the center circle. And then I've got some more templates and we're gonna route these templates in the same way that we did the uh, clock face earlier. Okay, let me fast forward you through some of the boring parts here. I sanded the clock face uh, front and back uh, to 220 grit. Um, that took off a lot of the fuzzies that the uh, router had left behind. And then I just spray painted the uh, face of this uh, on this other side uh, black. I used a matte black spray paint um, and it turned out looking pretty sharp. Uh, so these acrylic pieces that we cut earlier, I cut them to hide the seams behind elements of the clock so, so you won't see uh, where they're broken. Uh, this circle piece, I used the screw holes from the trammel uh, on both the clock face and the uh, acrylic to align those. And then I took and uh, traced around the circle and added a few little registration marks just to give me kind of a location because when I epoxy that in place, I'm going to put epoxy on the back face of this and I just want a, uh, a way to drop that in, into location without having to reposition it, which might smear some of the epoxy on uh, the front of the face. And I want to avoid that as much as possible. Now, uh, in order to epoxy uh, acrylic, you need a little bit of a tooth on there or a rough surface for the, uh, the epoxy to bond to. So I just used my random orbit sander and 80 grit sandpaper and just sanded the face of the entire acrylic. So once this uh, circle cures, then these uh, pieces just register up against that while I epoxy them in, into place. And they also hide behind seams and elements of the clock. And fingers crossed, let's give this a try. I'm going to just put these painter pyramids here 
and that goes about there, but I'm gonna get this side sort of in place. Okay, then I can come around here and just take these out, keep that kind of lined up. And as I go around, I'm gonna just keep my eye on those registration marks that I made earlier. And make sure that kind of falls into the right spot. And then that way, I don't have a whole lot of smearing this around that I have to do in order to make sure I'm in the right spot. Okay, while lead epoxy cures, here, I want you to take a look at something over here. Are you focused in on that, Parker? Yes. I, for one, love Roman numerals. Get it? I, for one, dad joke. Okay, what I, what I actually want to show you is over here. Look over here, Parker. Uh, uh, some of the pedants in the uh, crowd will have noticed that I uh, used I, 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 I for uh, the numeral four instead of IV. Um, and uh, the reason for that is it's uh, somewhat traditional. Uh, there are a lot of uh, theories about why this was used. You, I want you to go Google them. And then I want you to go into the comments and say, well, actually, here's the reason it was used. But I don't want you to use any of those real reasons. I want you to uh, do a, a completely fake reason. Just make something up. If somebody tries to correct you, say, well, actually, and then do something even more fanciful. Um, that'll keep the trolls busy for weeks. Uh, be a big favor to me. Parker, what is a, where does a pedant go to get water? Well, actually. <laughs> Dad joke. So to give this a 3D appearance, I'm going to uh, cut some strips and kerf bend them around the edge of this clock face. And so I've got some strips that I've cut up here. Uh, they are about four and a half inches wide because that looked good to me. Um, so if you had noticed, uh, I, I had when I cut this acrylic, I made it just a little smaller than the uh, clock face. And so um, I've got a rabbit here that will... Uh, engage that acrylic and I used a scrap of acrylic to set the depth of that rabbit and that acrylic will sit down in there while this extra lip uh, engages the back of that clock face. I also cut this groove down the back uh, inside edge of the rim here and that's to accommodate these LED lights that I bought. This is just a cheap strip of LED lights and that'll sit down in there. These have an adhesive back that I can kind of stick it down in there. So hopefully that will impart a slight glow to the clock face and make it look a little bit like a, a clock tower clock. Okay, anytime I get a dado blade out, I cut some extra scrap pieces the same width as the piece I'm working on because I always know I'm going to have to test my setup. I've got a stop block set up so that it gives me about inch and a half half lap. It doesn't need to be too precise. What does need to be precise is the cut depth here and so since this is half inch plywood that I'm working with we're gonna go uh, about in the quarter inch range we're gonna start a little skinny and work our way up okay and that's Pretty close, I need to raise that blade just a little bit. And that is just about dialed in. I think we'll call that good. Okay, I reset here to cut the kerfs and the plywood strips. Um, after playing around a bit, I found that uh, about a three quarter inch spacing uh, gives me enough of a, a gentle curve uh, without um, showing facets here 
when it's bending. Um, I've just set the height of the blade to cut just right up to this last little layer of veneer of plywood. Baltic birch has a, a little bit of a thicker uh, uh, veneer on it, so you may not want to uh, do the same thing if you're using a different type of plywood because the veneer may be a little too thin to handle uh, that. Now you'll notice I'm going to avoid making a, my initial cut through this half lap. I just want to keep this, the integrity of this half lap uh, for now. And so I'm going to cut the rest of this, glue up these half laps and come up, come back and cut maybe two or three through that half lap to finish up the bend. Now I've just made my setup so I can make my first cut with this uh, strip of plywood flush with my backer board. So I'd run that through. And then for the uh, subsequent cuts, I've just uh, made some marks on the insert plate and I'm just gonna line up previous cuts with the mark, um, cut the next one, cut the next one. Okay, there you go. One down, three more to go. So you can see I have my half laps glued together and it's made my uh, piece really long and, and unwieldy. Uh, this thing takes up most of my shop here. I need about 15 to 16 feet to go around this perimeter here. And so I've got a little extra, so I've got some room to uh, cut it to final length once I start putting this on. So the last little bit is to cut uh, grooves on the part where the half laps were at um, to make them bendy as well. Couldn't do that on the individual pieces because uh, it would have cut off the, the tongues here. Um, and now that it's this long and floppy and fragile, it's just too much to do on the table saw. So I'm going to turn to the circ saw to finish off these little grooves. And there you go, some bendy plywood. Okay, I've got several things going on here. I elevated the clock face. Uh, the way I did that was I just I cut some of the scrap foam that I had left over from my support here. Um, I cut these to strips to the width of this rabbit here. So um, I did double face tape the edges of this. And then what I did was I just carefully reached all the way under that clock and raised it up and slid those under. I tried to place them so that they were supporting the seams in the acrylic. That I was kind of worried about this part of it just because um, I was a little bit worried that the, the whole clock face is still a little floppy and I was a little bit worried that that uh, acrylic would pop off kind of like when you uh, pop ice cubes out of a plastic ice cube tray. But it held up pretty well and um, I'm definitely not as nervous about it anymore. Uh, and then this band then will provide some ex extra rigidity to that. And then by the time it's upright, we should be really good to go. Um, so the band itself is a big floppy noodle of, uh, plywood now. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've got about 16 plus feet of this stuff. So I had my, uh, helper here, um, help me set that up and very carefully we, wrapped it around uh, the clock face, and then I've just got it temporarily clamped into place here. To attach it, I'm just gonna use epoxy in this rabbit and on this surface here, and um, that should engage with the acrylic and the wood, and then I'm just gonna pin nail as I go around to hold that in place uh, while the epoxy cures.
I spun the clock around to get a little better access to this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to clamp uh, this piece on and just kind of clamp along here so it's flush. So that's going to fall about there. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to make a little mark with the knife. I'm going to take that back off. I'm going to very carefully flex this out and flex that one in. And now basically I do the same thing here with my clamps and then mark the wood for to be cut off. So this is the point in the project that we like to call in the postmortem. should have left well enough alone. You can see I've sanded the clock down and we could stop here, spray paint that uh, uh, rim uh, black and we'd be pretty close to the finish line. Uh, of course, I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to um, add some decorative touches here. So I've got some uh, strips of eighth inch plywood that I'm going to bend around uh, and tack that on make it look like a, some metal strapping. And then I found these uh, little guys in uh, one of my hardware bins. Um, I have no memory of ever purchasing these. I don't know where they came from, but I thought it'd be a good place to use these up. And I'm going to um, put those along that banding as if they're little uh, bolt heads. I thought that would look kind of neat. And then we'll spray paint the whole thing black. Um, so uh, what I want to do before I start tacking that on is I want to uh, mark my layout lines uh, to space these bolt heads out. And uh, I only had, I think, 52 of these, which doesn't really uh, space out evenly. I thought 48 would be a better number, so I'm going to use 48 of those. It'd be nice if I had 60 because I could just kind of put one of those on each of those sort of that minute marks around the clock. Um, but let me show you a trick for spacing these out. I've got my line marked here that's about the six o'clock position. I, I just eyeballed from the six, uh, uh, six uh, minute mark. Did the same on the nine, 12, and the three. Um, and then I stole this little uh, tape from my wife's sewing cabinet, and we're gonna use that to space these out. Um, now the, the distance from my six to my nine is about 47 inches, a little more. It's kind of a random number. So that 47 inch measurement is really bad for math and for dividing that out. But um, I flipped this over and this has a uh, centimeter scale on the backside. And when I pulled that around, it is uh, just about uh, 120 centimeters, which is a lot better when I'm trying to divide uh, 12 buttons into that length. So I'm just going to take a bit of tape and just tape that. So the top of my the top of my tape is on that mark. I'm just going to tape that in place. And then I'm going to stretch that tape around. and get it pretty flat. But then I'm just gonna move this tape down. I'm gonna swing it around until that uh, 120 mark lines up with my uh, nine o'clock mark here. And then I'm gonna tape that in place. Okay, so now our distance is 120. It's on the slant, but 
we can now just mark uh, every 10 centimeters like so. Transferred my lines for the button plugs and I'm just going to drill half inch holes and glue those in. I like to make a little mark for the hole first just to guide the drill bit. There we go, 47 more to go. So we flipped this over because so, we've got a couple things to do on the back before we're finished, but we're thankfully on the home stretch here. Um, the first thing is to uh, put the LED light strip in uh, the groove that we cut earlier. Um, this kit, I just got a cheap kit off the internet. It comes with uh, about 16 feet of LEDs, uh, power supply, a uh, little remote, and uh, this is kind of the uh, the hub of it. It has uh, power goes in here, uh, the LED plugs in here, and it's got a little infrared receiver for the remote. Um, I'm going to ignore the infrared receiver. You could drill a hole in the face of the clock and, and thread that through so that remote has access. But this thing also has a uh, Bluetooth control so I can control it with my phone. So I'm just gonna use that and avoid uh, drilling a hole in the face. Um, so the first thing we need to do is uh, locate the access for the power. And I'm just gonna drill a hole for that, for that cord to slot into. And that'll just sit in there and sit flat against, so that can sit flat against the wall. We're just gonna stick this in. There's some little arrows that I have to line up. I can't see this. Okay, there we go. So I'm just gonna kinda make sure that I'm kinda in a good position there. It's got an adhesive back, but I'm going to kind of give it a little reinforcement with my hot glue gun here. Most of these LED light strips have little cut lines where you can uh, cut this to, to the right size. So that's, that's what this little bit is here. And they cut pretty good with scissors. So we'll just do that. Uh, so the last thing on the back is uh, I need to make a hanger. And so I'm just, I had this last little scrap of uh, half inch plywood left over uh, out of my, I think I had to start with a half sheet. Um, and I just uh, cut that out of 45. We're gonna make a French cleat. Uh, so what I need, so this part will hang on the wall so we can set that aside for now. And then what I need to do is find points uh, straight across from each other so this hangs uh, straight up and down with the 12 at the top and the 6 at the bottom. And so what I'm going to do is kind of come in here and uh, mark where I want that 
to sit. And I think what I'm going to do is just kind of split this line here. So I'm going to use the little minute marks that I can see. I'm going to put a mark there, and that is two from the ten. I'm going to go one, two from here. Let's transfer this up to the top. I'm going to assume those are kind of uniform. And then I'm going to trace this curve on here. And then we'll reverse it when we actually cut that off. And I think I can live with that. I'm going to do some pocket holes on the ends, glue it up and stick it in. Okay guys, I think it's big reveal time. Let's see if this silly thing worked. Okay, that is, it's not too bad. You like? Okay, let's try, try this out. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I like that. That's pretty cool. Okay, hey, uh, turn the lights out. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. That okay, now I, cool now I can't see the buttons. Okay, that's the lowest white. That's kind of cool, though. I mean, that would kind of make a cool night light in your, in your house, you know. Yeah. It also looks a little bit eerie. Yeah. Last bit out here is to put the clock movement into the back of the clock here. Um, this is a high torque clock movement, and I needed that because I got the longest clock hands I could find, that's a minute hand, um, without actually springing for a clock tower mechanism. So this is the normal assembly uh, of a clock movement here. Um, you, you have the movement and a, a little gasket on the back. That gasket just provides some friction uh, and some padding for the movement. So when the clock is moving over the years, it's not going to kind of shake that loose. Uh, put these two in the back, add the washer, the nut screws onto here, uh, press fit for the hour hand, and the uh, minute hand has a little uh, oval shape that locks it into place. And then you put a nut. This movement uh, came with an extra brass one if you prefer that. Since my theme is black, I'm going to use that one. Now since I have pretty much uh, made the thickest clock face that this movement will handle, I'm going to have to eliminate the uh, gasket and the washer from, um, from my setup. And what I'll do instead is I will just um, use some hot glue to kind of secure that in place so it doesn't move over time or wiggle itself loose. So that's pretty stable now. Um, what I did is I wound the clock until the minute hand is on the 12. We'll need that later. Okay, and then now I'm going to secure this in place with the, the little nut. And we're not going to tighten that too hard because we don't want to restrict the clock movement, but just probably finger tight and then a little more. Okay, now the uh, hour hand is a press fit. It's got, a, it's got some... Uh, a little rim around it that kind of flares a bit and we're just going to press that on the plastic and we're going to press that 
facing the 12 as well. Now the minute hand, again, we set that to the 12. And the reason for that is uh, we wanna make sure that when we're putting this, uh, the hands in place, that it's actually on a, a real time, right? So if we had put the uh, minute hand down on the six and the hour hand on the 12, that's not a real time. It needs to be, you know, the hour hand would have to be halfway in between. So we know that if we have it on a real time, the rest of the times are going to work. So then we just place that on the little oval thing. And then tighten. And then put the little nut on top. And there you go. Hands in place. So to mount this thing, we need to first hang up our French cleat here. I want to make sure I hit at least two studs and preferably three. Um, so we got to find our studs. And to do that, I've just got a little magnet. And that will uh, let me find the screws or nails that nail into the studs. Oh. Right there. I'm going to uh, mark another one here and another one there. So how high do we want it? Um, I know that my French cleat on the back of the clock is about three feet up from the bottom of the clock. Um, I made myself a mark where I want the bottom of that clock to come to. So we'll go about three feet up from there. position our cleat well, aim our cleat about about right there so I don't need really this full length of cleat uh, what I can do is cut this down and then kind of center it on those studs and what that will do is instead of locking that edge of that clock in on that uh, on the side of that cleat it'll give me a little room to uh, slide that back and forth. Okay, and then we just drop that in place on the cleat. Uh, we set it beforehand and then we will plug in our lights. And there we go. Giant clock. So in conclusion, guys, this was a pretty fun project to make. I think it turned out looking great. Uh, Parker gives it two thumbs up, even though uh, it got rejected for the magazine. Um, so you guys get off the stupid phone or computer and go out to your shop and make something now. It doesn't have to be this, but send me pictures when you do. Is that good? Did I get everything? It's hard to remember yeah, all the parts. The self promo. Self promo. What's the self promo? Like, like encouraging people to to like and subscribe. No, I'm encouraging people to get off this thing. <laughs> I'm encouraging people to. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm encouraging people to stop watching videos and go get in their shop. <laughs> but like, don't like. Don't subscribe. That caters to the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> don't be ruled by an algorithm. <laughs>